begin transmission. Now, we, there is such a tremendous diversity of life on this planet that sadly we will not be able to um, communicate about all of them in depth. And so I've been writing down all our notes and um, getting them all together and then packaging them, sending them off to you through uh, space as I'm doing um, this, this video as well. And um, you have been following along, I'm assuming, and we are now at chapter 14, which is all about um, phylum Echinodermata, which includes some really interesting animals called starfish and sea cucumbers, um, cucumbers that live in the sea. And unfortunately, we don't have time to uh, talk about them um, this year. So uh, we want to get to the vertebrates, the, the groups of the highest complexity on this planet, and uh, the group that we have the most um, affinity towards. They're, they tend to be cute and cuddly and um, oftentimes reminiscent of ourselves. So I want to spend enough time on vertebrates. Uh, but they, I want to acknowledge that there's this, this distinct jump from talking about insects to then talking about fish. How do we get from insects to fish? Um, well, evolutionarily speaking, this is a, this is a difficult um, transition to get from invertebrate without any kind of solid backbone internally to then have an internal solid um, vertebra. <clears throat> um, so how does that happen? This is uh, the subject of chapter 15. So in chapter 15, um, the only thing I want you to read in chapter 15, there's a section on five hallmarks of chordata because vertebrates are in phylum chordata, subphylum um, vertebrata. So all um, vertebrates are chordates, but not all chordates are vertebrates. And uh, one particularly interesting non-vertebrate chordate uh, we discovered just the other day, and you can see it see it here. It's a very uh, very strange marine creature, and the ocean is just consistently full of surprises. As we look at it, you can see that what seem to be clusters of very similar looking structures that open and close somewhat rhythmically. This is a tunicate, and tunicates are not vertebrates, but they're chordates. They have those, those five hallmarks of chordata that I would like you to know. And they're colonial, um, these particular ones are colonial organisms. So um, they operate very similarly to sponges, right? They have an incurrent and excurrent siphon, and they filter water for organic particles. And yet their internal physiology, their structures, um, are in a lot of ways reminiscent of our own. And uh, so read about um, the five chordate hallmarks. <clears throat> um, know that tunicates are an example of a non-vertebrate chordate. And know that from here to the end of the um, uh, whatever, whatever it is we're doing here, uh, until, I'm, until I'm done, um, we will be talking about phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata. And we will begin with the fishes. Life on this planet in the oceans is dominated by fishes. And yes, I said fishes rather than fish. The plural for um, multiple species of fish is technically fishes. So today we'll be talking about fishes rather than just fish, which are is the correct plural for multiple individuals of the same species. But if you're talking about multiple species, it's fishes. I always get that question, so I gotta gotta start with that right from the very beginning. Um, the the fish we find in the oceans are um, amazingly diverse. There are over 28,000 species of fish, more than all other vertebrates combined, and as far as we can tell, they're all aquatic. A few of them can survive on land for brief periods of time but uh, the majority of the species are marine, and then there are also some freshwater species. A few can fly, kind of, if you, you, know, if you give them a little bit of grace, um, and a few walk on, on land for a little bit, but predominantly these are um, aquatic vertebrates, and the most diverse of all the vertebrates combined. Their diversity can be seen in, um, I'm just gonna show you a few spectacular fish right here. This one here is the blobfish. It's a deep sea fish. It's not used to being pulled up from the depths. And when it does, it starts oozing because this particular fish is kind of held together by the, the tremendous 
pressure of the deep ocean. And so unfortunately, when you bring it up to the surface, it becomes all blobby, um, poor blobfish. This one here is another deep um, sea fish. And deep sea fish live often in pitch dark blackness where the only lights that exist are the lights that are produced by the organisms there. And so you have several challenges. Um, most fish are gonna use bioluminescence for two um, purposes. One is to attract prey. And so a little delicious little fish is gonna come investigate the light source and then get munched like uh, this viper fish does. He has a row of lights along the ventral side right here. And when um, curious fish come to see what's what, they get eaten. It also makes seeing very difficult. And so some fish have some pretty remarkable adaptations to figure out um, how to see. These are hatchet fish. And these creepy little faces are always pointed up with these nice bulbous eyes to catch any sliver of light that filters down. And they don't live uh, too, too deep. Um, they, they live in depths where there's little light, but there's still some and they usually catch their prey from below, and so they're looking for shadows up above them. So they're perpetually looking up with these huge eyes trying to see shadows above them. Even more spectacular is the barrel eye fish, and rather than upturning his face, this species has evolved instead um, a transparent head and eyes that instead of pointing out, point up. So these are the eyes. They would normally be pointing out straight here, but those all closed up. They point straight up and its head is translucent, which is just such a strange way of doing it, right? Uh, very different than the hatchet face fish who kind of tilts his whole face up. Um, this, the barrel eyed fish just uh, does away with having a, um, a skull, which is, I guess, one way to do it. We are usually familiar with the apex predators of the ocean, the, the sharks, and they can be the quite ferocious and um, fearsome beasts. But uh, some of them can also be fairly docile. This is the Greenland shark, and the Greenland shark is a, a slow-moving, uh, extremely low metabolic rate um, shark that lives beneath um, the icy oceans in the Arctic. A very cold, tolerant species, and some of these species um, appear to be at least 300 years old, so longer um, longer than I've been alive, um, for sure. And so there are some um, fish, especially in the deep sea, that are incredibly old. Um, we don't even know how old, because we haven't explored all the oceans yet. Uh, this is a little uncomfortable, because some fish's teeth look just like a nice little human's teeth. And so we can tell a lot by what a fish eats by its teeth. This particular mouth is adapted for shearing algae, a little plant. So we have lots of herbivorous fish, lots of um, predaceous fish like the sharks, and like this monstrosity here, the Goliath tiger fish. And um, this this really highlights how the fish eats is like their their body is basically just a, a stomach with teeth at the end. Uh, when they eat their prey, it just goes right into their stomach. These uh, gashes right here, those are the gills. So as they breathe, they're just going to force water in through their mouth and then out through their gills. And so really the, the fish is just one with the water. The water is just flowing through them. Um, food is flowing through them. There's not really very much of a separation between their body and the environment they live in. Everything's all mixed together. And it makes me deeply uncomfortable. I'm not sure about fish. Oh, this is um, this is Camilla. She is a, um, a cookie cutter shark, and she likes to hide in um, closets and under beds and comes out at night. She's particularly fond of um, chocolate chip cookies and um, the souls of young children. So uh, watch out for Camilla, a little bit dangerous creature. So why are fish so important? Well, as the most uh, diverse vertebrate in the ocean, these are oftentimes the most intelligent um, animals in the ocean. Um, some of them can make tools and can construct construct habitats. And so their main benefit is in the biodiversity they create and the relationships they form, especially in coral reefs. We've talked about a lot of this before, but um, there are uh, coral reefs are kind of foundational 
habitat creators in ocean environments. And fish are an important um, uh, community, community member of coral reef ecosystems. We've talked about clownfish and their sea anemone uh, mutualistic relationships. But in the ocean, you're going to have predators and herbivores. You're going to have um, mutualistic relationships and commensals. And you're also going to have one particular species of parasite. Um, this is a sea cucumber, and a relative of the starfish. And what is wiggling into its butt is a pearlfish. The pearlfish lives inside the anus of a sea cucumber and it munches away at the, the sea cu cucumber's food and digestive system. And sea cu cucumbers actually breathe through um, their butts as well. So there's respiratory um, things to munch on as well for the pearlfish. But this is one of the, the few vertebrate um, parasites. There's not very many of them, but this is the pearlfish just making himself at home in the sea cucumber. When we look at the evolutionary history of fish on Earth, we have a, a tremendous fossil record. And um, this is another example of pretty fantastic convergent evolution. What it, what it seems like when we're looking at this planet and we look back at Earth's um, history, it seems that life tends to follow the same uh, kind of trajectory. Um, and now don't be intimidated by the list of words here. That's a, that's a big long list of words. Chondrichthys and Actinopterygii and Um And you may notice that in the classification system, we have a new taxonomic rank. This is the infraphylum. Fish are in phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata. And so all of the, all of the fish are going to have um, vertebra or at least um, some kind of cord that runs, that uh, protects their, their dorsal nerve cord. And within subphylum vertebrata, we have two infraphyla. So um, infraphyla are one step below subphyla, one step above classes. So it's just another kind of fine ranking that we can, can, we can use to differentiate groups within groups of animals. And we're going to have two main infraphyla, the cyclostomata and the nathostomata. And both of these um, have living members here. This group right here are the cyclostomes, and then all the rest are nathostomes. Within nathostomata, we're going to have the chondrichthys, which are going to be the sharks, skates, rays, and friends, and the actin actinopterygii, which are um, all of these guys. And then the sarcopterygians, what are these guys are up here, the lungfish and the coelacanths. So uh, within infraphylum nathostomata, there are three um, classes, and then there are some subclasses we have to know. This is really just an overview um, for you to come back to after we talked about each of these in turn. What I want to point out to you here is that there, um, there are some really remarkable points of diversification. If we look at what Earth was like a thousand years ago, most of the, the Earth-like um, animals in the ocean were uh, modern bony fishes in subclass Neopterygii. 95% of the, the fish were Neopterygians before they all went extinct during the second great dying. Uh, the first great dying, um, this is named after an extinction level event that happened right around here. And um, in that first great dying, all of these um, Acanthodians uh, went extinct. And um, also the, the Placoderms and the Ostracoderms went extinct. So we can see that there were, um, there were several mass extinctions in Earth's history. Um, not all of them caused by humans, <clears throat> but at the end of the Devonian, right here, there was this, the first great dying, and we lost organisms like this, Dunkleosteus, this giant bony armored um, fish, didn't really have teeth, instead it just had these shearing bony plates for eating its prey, and really heavy, slow moving creature, those all went extinct. The other thing I want to point out, so the first thing I want to point out is um, kind of how diversity has changed over time in the history of Earth. The second thing I want to point out is um, if you think about where trees show up in the fossil record and conventionally, uh, according to evolutionary time scale, the trees are going to be mostly diversifying in the Carboniferous, the end of the Devonian. And what you notice is that the sharks, <clears throat> they start diversifying in the middle Devonian. And so what this means is that sharks are older than trees. 
which is uh, pretty phenomenal. So according to um, evolutionary theory, sharks appeared in the world before um, there were even trees on land. So sharks are an incredibly old, ancient uh, lineage, and so they have some 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 pretty cool um, features that are they're pretty ancient-y. And when we look at the phylogenetics, what I want to point out here is that the word fish is not a taxon, right? That's not taxonomic rank. It's not phylum fish or subphylum fish or class fish. What we have is subphylum um, vertebrata and then two infraphyla. And then we have classes within um, that. And I want to point out this little group right here, the tetrapods, the four-limbed animals. These are going to be the reptiles, mammals, birds, um, amphibians. And if you notice, if we made, if we did make a, um, a fishy taxonomy that had fish as um, maybe a, a phylum and included these guys right here, what kind of phylogenetic group would this be? You have a common ancestor. Actually, let's go ahead and include chondrichthys. Um, I mean, we could go back and include everything. So if we have everything included except the tetrapods, what kind of phylogenetic group would this be? You guessed it, 100% of you got it right. Good job. A paraphyletic group. So we have a common ancestor, but not all of its descendants. The tetrapods are left out. And so tetrapods um, uh, uh, supposedly evolved from these lobe-finned fishes-like ancestors down here. And so if we excluded these, that would make um, fish paraphyletic. So fish is not a real taxonomic um, group anymore because it is paraphyletic and we destroy all things that are paraphyletic, right? What this means in function, so remember we talked about birds and dinosaurs, and um, so we call birds dinosaurs because birds are nested within the dinosaur um, phylogenetic tree. So similarly, all the tetrapods are technically fish. And so you're a fish, a hummingbird is a fish, an elephant is a fish, a snake is a fish, and a fish is a fish um, because they're all part of the same phylogenetic group. And um, just conventionally, that makes things pretty confusing. So in common practice, fish, we kind of know what fish are. They're the, the fishy things in the ocean, and a frog is not a fish, except technically, phylogenetically speaking, the fish, the, the frogs are a fish, and you're a fish. So. Happy fish birthday. Oh, this this fish, no, so this this is a crazy looking uh, monstrosity, right? So this is a, um, a holocephalon from this group right here. And what do you notice is strange about it? Several things. Um, one thing is that it has these weird um, extensions on its fins. Don't know what that's about. It also has this weird, like, um, these are called denticles all over its uh, the top of its face and then it has this incredibly strange shape on the dorsal fin we don't really know particularly what that is for um, and it seems to maybe in some species be inflatable um, but it's uh, on the top it's covered with these same kind of denticles which are hard like little uh, tooth like projections uh, the guesses I've heard is maybe um, for attaching to a larger mammal, um, or not, not a mammal, a larger animal, and so it kind of, um, like a remora fish, will um, latch onto a, a larger host. These were about three feet long, and so maybe the denticles help it adhere, but they're not really adhering denticles. Another idea is that they help with mating somehow for kind of um, uh, grabbing onto a mate. I don't really see that being that functional either. Um, the best idea I've heard, which is still just a hypothesis, is that they could inflate it and deflate it, and so it might serve as some type of a, um, either an intimidation signal or a mating signal for maybe they did a, a little mating dance and a part, of, part of that was inflating this, this giant um, dorsal fin thing with tentacles on top. I don't know, um, but very strange creature. So there's lots of um, unusual creatures that we, we get to explore today. Starting with infraphylum cyclostomata. So remember these are in phylum chordata, subphylum vertebrata, um, infraphylum cyclostomata. And it, within cyclostomata, we're gonna have two classes, the mixenes and the petromyzontids. And what uh, these classes have in common is their lack of jaws, 
and their lack of something called ossification. So they have neither jaws nor ossification. Ossification is essentially um, true bone, um, uh, even even uh, pretty robust cartilage can be phosph um, phosphorylated and have some bony elements to it. These guys are pretty uh, eel-like in shape and they're basically just muscular um, critters. They don't really have any true bones on the inside and they don't have jaws. Similarly, on the sides they have gill um, openings that are circular or oval. Those are called pores rather than gill slits. And so they lack jaws, they lack ossification, they have gill pores rather than slits, and so they are in cyclostomata rather than nathostomata. In class uh, Mixini, we have the hagfish, and hagfish are um, deep sea scavengers. They don't really have um, very many eyes to, sk to speak of, so they're, they're functionally blind, but they have these uh, barbels that are incredibly sensitive to um, smell and touch and so they can they can track down a dead or dying animal um, from miles away and swim to it and start ripping flesh off its its bones. Hagfish are well known for generating copious amounts of slime so they have little slime glands um, scattered throughout their lateral um, side and they just produce all kinds of slime. It's a pretty incredible chemical um, when in contact with water it turns, it essentially turns the water into this slimy gelatinous mixture. So if something bites it, it's, it secretes the chemical and then the water all around it becomes slimy and it's foul tasting and difficult to get rid of. So it's a, a pretty good deterrent for predators. They don't have any bones, so they're also gonna lack um, denting teeth. So to, to rip flesh off their scavenged prey, they're gonna have these, these flat, uh, tongues that can fold in half and the tongues are full of keratinized teeth. So keratin is what your fingernails and hair is made from. It's similar to the chitin of um, insect exoskeletons. It's tough, water resistant, acid resistant, uh, protective, uh, has a lipid layer to it. So these are, um, it's not quite as cool as an exoskeleton, but it's, it's still a, a pretty nice inexpensive protective protein. Um, that, you, that your, bo your body makes. So these keratinized teeth latch onto prey, fold in half and kind of rip chunks away. But if you notice, the hagfish has no arms, it has no fingers, has no arms, so it can't really do much ripping. So what it does is it ties itself into a knot. You can see here, it ties itself into a knot and then moves the knot down until it can press up against the, 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 the prey with the knot and then it uses that force to rip flesh away from its prey. And they can be pretty, uh, pretty effective um, as well. So this right here, I want to point out um, the notochord. This is what this is the synapomorphy of phylum chordata. So, so they're going to have a, a thick rod that um, protects their spinal cord and gives them stability and structure to their whole um, body. They have a very large olfactory sac for sensing um, chemicals in the water. And uh, like I said, no really, no, no eyes. They have their, their primary heart is by their gills. And um, then they have several um, three to five accessory hearts throughout their body that they use to help pump the blood um, as, as they go. The next group is class Petromyzontida and Petromyzontids are these um, spectacular looking um, parasites called lampreys and lampreys have no jaws, rather they have these keratinized um, teeth in, ring, in circular rings and they latch onto their prey, rip into the flesh, and then um, drink blood. They have a pretty potent anticoagulant that they secrete, which keeps the blood flowing until they get their fill. Lampreys are anadromous, which means adults live in marine environments, but the eggs are laid in fresh water. So every year during breeding season, the lampreys um, who live in the ocean migrate up freshwater streams to find a nice little gravel bed to lay eggs in. And uh, once they lay eggs, the, the larvae develop into Amocetes larvae. So I've got a picture here of a male and female. Um, the male will... Um, make a little nest 
by wiggling back and forth and make a little oval depression into the sand and then uh, the female will, will join him. The female lays eggs externally and fertilization happens um, externally. The eggs are kind of sticky and they get stuck down in this little oval depression. The, the Amocetes larvae of lampreys filter feed. They dig little, little burrows and then they filter feed for um, several years um, some, in some species until they metamorphose into adults. <clears throat> the adults are mainly parasitic Although some adults don't feed at all, and they mainly exist to reproduce and then die. Uh, but the parasitic stages are what we're most interested in because they cause significant damage to fish populations. If they don't kill them directly, when they, when they have had their fill, they leave. And they leave with huge wounds on their hosts, and these can get infected and can uh, become fatal. So lampreys are a pretty, pretty nasty parasite of fish populations and can be quite invasive in um, some freshwater areas. This is, uh, this is Edward. Um, Edward is a um, chimera, which is a, um, a type of holocephalon, and which is a type of chondrichthys. Edward likes to snuffle along the bottom of the ocean, uh, digging through um, dirt and sand and finding juicy little crustaceans to eat. That's how Edward spends um, his days. And Edward is an example of um, the subclass Holocephaly. Um, there's another subclass in class Contrictes called Elasmobranchii, and that is going to include the sharks and the rays, and also the skates. So in Infrophylum Nathostoma, um, Nathostomes differ from Cyclostomes in that they have jaws, and they have, they have some type of internal ossification, eventually true bone. And uh, class chondrichthys within Infraphylum nathostoma, uh, nathostomata is um, these are defined by their cartilaginous skeletons. So sharks and skates and rays they don't really have true bony skeletons. Um, rather, they have some some ossified cartilage that gives them um, a skeleton. So we have two subclasses within um, class chondrichthys: Elasmobranchii and Holocephaly. First off, the sharks. So sharks we're familiar with. These are in um, Elasmobranchii. Sharks, um, how do you know a shark from a not a shark? Uh, well, it looks very shark-like, to, uh, to be fair. Um, and it's important to know the names for all these fins, and they're not very difficult to know. Uh, this is a dorsal fin, because it's found on the dorsal side. And um, then these are pectoral fins, because they're found on the pectoral girdle. And these are pelvic fins, and then a caudal fin. Caudal means tail. Um, so we have an anterior dorsal fin and a posterior dorsal fin. We have pectoral fins, we have pelvic fin fins, uh, we, there's an anal fin right here, and then we have a caudal fin. The caudal fin has two um, lobes, a dorsal lobe and a ventral lobe. And if the dorsal lobe is longer than the ventral lobe, or they're different sizes. This is called a heterocircle tail. tail. Hetero means different. And sharks within class, subclass Elasmobranchii have heterocircle tails. So that's one synapomorphy of sharks. The other major synapomorphy are their scales. So they have placoid scales. And these scales are really remarkable. Here's kind of a microscopic image of them. They are actually, their, their teeth are modified placoid scales. So um, if you want a, a clickbait title, you know, their whole body is covered in teeth. So sharks are pretty remarkable animals. This gives them um, a very sleek, smooth, um, aerodynamic uh, appearance. And the, the water just rushes past them and it reduces drag. So, and if you rub your hand kind of opposite the, the direction of the, of the scales, you can actually feel that they're pretty spiky and rough. So placoid scales are, are unique to elasmobranchs, and on the, in their mouth, they are um, covered in dentine and modified into teeth. Sharks also have some pretty remarkable abilities to detect prey. Their eyesight is fairly good at close range, but over long distances, they use um, something called a lateral line system. And uh, the lateral, lateral line system, um, I'm going to talk about that. And then also I want to point out these little uh, dermal pores that you see here, these little holes on its, on its snout. 
These are um, ampullae of Lorenzini, and the ampullae of Lorenzini um, detect electrical currents. So I'll talk about the lateral line system and the ampullae of Lorenzini. The lateral line system is a little canal that runs along the lateral side of the shark, as you might expect. And inside these little canals, you have this gelatinous um, uh, group of cells here. And neuromast cells have little um, cilia um, that stick into there. And when a, a prey item or a mate or a, a diver, a human, um, moves in the water, that sends, that reverberates out from the source of the, of the movement, right? And so the water is full of these vibrations and the vibrations hit these openings and uh, vibrate down here and then start shaking the little jelly. And when the jelly shakes, um, the speed and direction of it um, influences the cilia and then the cilia sends signals about what is happening to the brain. So the lateral line system is all about detecting um, vibrations in the water, uh, particularly of prey, but you know whatever you're really looking for. Um, so this is particularly good at subsonic vibrations, so the things that can't be seen or heard, the lateral line can pick up. When they get close to prey, the ampullae of Lorenzini, these little pores everywhere, um, these are really helpful for detecting electrical current. So every living thing generates um, at least a little bit of electricity, and sharks can detect that little bit of electricity. And um, so again, you have this little jelly-filled canal connected to cells that will then transmit the signals to the brain. Uh, but these detect the electrical current of prey. Shark reproduction is um, fairly straightforward. The sexes are separate, and the males are easily identified by um, these elongate part of their pectoral fins called, I mean, pelvic fins called claspers. So here you can see the male and the female. So pelvic fins with claspers, male, pelvic fins without claspers, female. The claspers are inserted into the female and they don't deliver the sperm themselves, but sperm is released from the cloaca and then um, the claspers form like a little trench that the sperm can flow down. So the claspers aren't um, intromittent organs, they don't transfer sperm directly, but they're used to uh, deliver sperm to the female. The male will often, um, as you can see here, hold the female on um, one of her fins to kind of keep her in place while um, mating occurs. And then after that, they go on about their lives. Sharks are usually solitary creatures in most species and really only come together for mating. There are a few gregarious species, but uh, for the most part, they're solitary. Now, uh, sharks have all kinds of different reproductive strategies, um, ranging from oviparity, the laying of eggs, and this is one of those here. You can see the little embryo, this little baby shark, and then a little yolk sac. Collectively, this is um, commonly called a mermaid's purse, and you can find them in the ocean periodically, and it's a little developing baby there. So oviparity is laying eggs, and viviparity is giving live birth. So what is ovoviviparity? Well, um, there's actually a lot of different ways to define that um, in different groups of animals. So let's just say oviparity is laying an egg, viviparity is giving live birth, and then ovoviviparity is somewhat in the middle. Okay, so that, that means that sometimes you're gonna, give, you're gonna lay an egg, but the egg is had been eaten, incubated in your uterus for a while, and it's gonna hatch almost immediately. So technically you're oviparous, but it's basically viviparity. So that's one aspect of viviparity. Um, you could also, um, and that's the most common that sharks do. So um, uh, let's just focus on that one actually. So oviviparity for sharks means um, they're gonna give, they're gonna lay an egg, which is gonna hatch almost immediately. There's not prolonged incubation in the egg outside the female. Um, some sharks will actually fight um, in utero. In utero, so viviparous tiger sharks are famous for the, for this. The um, the sharks will fight each other. There's there's almost always twins, and only one shark will emerge victorious. So sharks are kind of birthed in death and blood. Um, skates and rays are relatives of sharks. They're in the same subclass, Elasmobranchii, but they're distinctly different, as you can see here. 
but um, I think it's, it will be worth pointing out their similarity. So what do you see here? Can you identify the fins on this ray? The most obvious thing here, they have some, some bulges, um, bulbous eyes, <clears throat> and then right here you have a gigantic spiracle. Um, sharks have spiracles too. Spiracles are kind of a secondary oxygen delivery system. They can uh, they can take in oxygen or water and filter oxygen through the gills. And they're much larger in rays than they are in sharks because the mouth of um, the ray is often um, embedded in sand. So if you can't breathe through your mouth, you want your secondary spiracle to be your primary uh, breathing source. So what are the these little flappy things? What kind of fins are those? Well, those are just modified pectoral fins. So the pectoral fins have gotten a larger and the body has become dorsoventrally flattened. So what has happened to the, the anterior and posterior dorsal fins? They seem absent until you look back here and you see an anterior dorsal fin and a posterior dorsal fin. And you have this really unique um, stinging tail that often has uh, toxic venom in it. And you still, you have the pelvic fins right here too. So the fins are there, but they're, they're highly modified, very different than they are in sharks. And this, this one here, uh, you can actually see it a lot better. You see the, um, the pectoral fin here, pelvic fins here, and then the anterior dorsal and posterior dorsal fin. Um, very interesting. And I could show you a whole spectrum of sharks where um, it goes from, you know, your classic great white to your classic manta ray. And then these guys are kind of in the middle and you can see a pretty good uh, progression in uh, modified uh, fins. This one right here is, a, is an, an electric ray. They have special organs on their head that produce electricity that they use to stun their prey, which I think is pretty a phenomenal superpower for a little fish. Um, uh, rays and skates also different, um, differ from sharks in their teeth. So sharks are primarily predators of other fish, whereas skates and rays like to eat crustaceans and mollusks. And so uh, they're gonna have interlocking flat plate-like teeth that they use to crunch open the shells of their prey rather than sharp pointy teeth like sharks. Also, what's the difference between a skate and a ray? Um, I always get that question. And I think the difference is uh, has to do with the, the tail. Um, rays can sting and skates don't. That's what I'm going with for now. And look at this cute little baby, baby ray. You can see the, the pelvic fins um, look like little feet in this creature, but you can see that they, they have little extensions there. Pretty strange, right? Yes, pretty strange. Not as strange as this creature. What in the world is this creature? Helicoprion. And Helicoprion has an incredibly unusual tooth whirl. And so as it ages, the, the jaw actually, uh, we don't know particularly how it's, it's oriented. Uh, we primarily know these from fossils where we find these, these elaborate tooth whirls. And we think as they, as they age, the, um, the teeth kind of rotate out. So you get this like little buzzsaw appearance here which seems to make eating rather, rather difficult. Um, so holocephaly has some, some pretty incredible creatures. The buzzsaw shark here, the, the weird denticled um, shark we talked about earlier. Um, but these are, these are, con uh, these are um, in chondric these, but they're not, they're, they, they differ from sharks in that they don't have placoid scales. And um, they're, they're pretty rarely caught the, this, the, the common name for these is chimeras because they often look like they've been stitched together from a variety of, of organisms. And they just, they're just they just a very strange group of fish. A lot of them are deep sea. Um, but here, again, I want, you to, I want you to be able to identify anterior dorsal fin, posterior dorsal fin, pectoral and pelvic fins. And um, this guy here, this gigantic snout, that one probably is used for sensing electrical currents of prey and uh, maybe for trudging up the, the deep ocean, the, the muddy sediments looking for, worm, for worms to eat. So um, our funny little, little chimera earlier, Edward, he's, he's a part of this group too. So just a, just a really incredible diverse group of organisms. A few miles off the coast of this particular continent, there is this beautiful tropical paradise island. 
that many of us would like to go to, but going there has been strictly forbidden because this island is in fact not um, a paradise. It is more hell than heaven. This is, we're referring to this um, island as Snake Island uh, after the organisms that inhabit it. This, uh, this island is covered in venomous reptiles without legs that slither around. And keeping in our tradition of naming things after their method of locomotion, um, flies, for example, I won. I voted to name this Slither Island and name these little creatures Slithers, but um, apparently um, that wasn't good enough. Um, they want to go as snakes. I don't even know what a snake is. What does that even mean? Um, slithers makes much more sense. <clears throat> so um, Slither Island, as I like to call it, is a, a forbidden place to go because there are these golden lance head serpents, um, snakes, slithers, there that are incredibly venomous. Their venom will melt your flesh at the bite, bite, bite wound, uh, literally just disintegrate your muscle tissue, and they are extremely dangerous. Usually apex predators like that are going to be in um, very, very rare in ecosystems, but this island is special. Uh, because there is there are migratory birds that stop there in great abundance, which um, allows for a high density of snakes. And by high density, I mean three to five snakes per square meter. Three to five snakes per square meter on this island, um, according to some estimations. Uh, this is why it is now forbidden to go there. And I tell you all this because it is to this island that many of us on the crew are actively considering exiling our biochemist, Dr. J. Cordaceris. The trial of Dr. Cordaceris has revealed two significant revelations so far, two very surprising revelations. The first has to do with the identity of the toxin used to kill poor Dr. Mastronomer, and the second has to do with the identity of Dr. Cordaceris himself. So first of all, we analyze the toxin more specifically, compared it to all known proteins in all of Earth's um, historical and um, present databases, and it turns out that it is an atracotoxin, named after one of the, the, uh, the most potent venoms in Earth's past, coming from Atrax robustus, <clears throat> the Sydney funnel web spider. Now, this atracotoxin is, is unique because it affects insects and it affects primates, but it doesn't um, really greatly affect other mammals. So it's a, it's a unique kind of toxin to use, the kind of toxin a biochemist would know about, be able to synthesize, and be able to predict um, that it would be an effective murder weapon. Not looking good for Dr. Cordaceris. Secondly, <clears throat> we, uh, we looked through this, this logbook that was found in Dr. Cordaceris' quarters, and we found in it a picture that was circled um, with Dr. Mastronomer's handwriting, and um, the cap um, on the margins it says, Dr. J. Cordaceris, not J underlined, which is somewhat cryptic. <clears throat> and uh, we looked at the picture, and it's a, it's a picture of a, of a student at the, the grad school that an astronomer went to because not, not just astronomers went there, lots of people went to the grad school and when she graduated, everybody's picture was published in the um, graduation catalog thing. So apparently, Dr. Cordaceris and Dr. Mastronomer graduated from the same university at the same time, different degrees, of course. Um, but when you look at the picture under Dr. Um, J. Cordaceris, it is not the person whose identity that we have all thought was J. Cordaceris. There's a, a reminiscence of them, but it is, it is not the same person at all. And I think this is what Dr. Mastronomer discovered. And if you remember um, what, what um, started this investigation was Master Sergeant Rush um, being suspicious because Dr. Mastronomer had told him she had found something particularly interesting, and was going to tell him, and then she died. And uh, Master Sergeant Rush is convinced that this is what she was trying to communicate, that Dr. Cordaceris is not who he says he is. When approached with this evidence, um, Dr. Cordaceris um, now admitted that he did take the logbook. So he's admitted to theft, 
and he's admitted to being imposter. Um, and here's, here's his story. So he said that uh, Dr. Jared Cordaceres was his father and was a renowned biochemist, had always dreamed of going to space on this kind of expedition. Um, but as kind of a side hobby, <clears throat> he, um, he and his son, Jay Cordaceres, operated a corn dog stand. And um, unfortunately, there's a terrible tragedy one summer day. And uh, the, the senior, Dr. Cordaceres, was killed in a freak corn dog stand explosion. I said freak corn dog stand explosion. Um, now, the, the name of this stand I thought was pretty clever. It was um, Dippin' Dogs, the, the corn dogs of the future. Um, but even that, uh, that brilliant name did not save them from a death of hot oil. And so Dr. Um, Dr. Cordaceres <clears throat> ass um, assumed the identity of his father so he could fulfill his father's lifelong dream of joining this crew. So here's what we've got. We've got a, um, a, a fake Dr. Cordaceres who uh, really is Dr. Cordaceres. He, ha he, has a, he has a background in biochemistry just like his father, but he is not really qualified for this particular kind of mission. Um, he's taken on the identity of his father so he can um, sneak on board the ship, um, so he can fulfill some kind of misguided notion of <clears throat> living out his father's dreams in memory of his poor um, corn dog oil soaked and exploded father. Not, not looking good. So uh, with this evidence in hand, he really is uh, the prime suspect. He had motivation. He is a biochemist, so he had, he had, he had means. Um, he had the opportunity. And those are, those, those are the big three in, um, in criminal investigations. So tomorrow he's going to um, be given a chance to defend himself, but none of us, um, all of us have pretty much decided that, uh, well, we're going to give him a chance. We're, we're an advanced um, legal society. Um, so we'll wait to make a judgment until we can hear his side of the story, but it better be good, otherwise, Snake Island.